All right, let's uh, talk a little bit about plants and plant phylogeny. So we want to talk about the adaptations of terrestrial of plants to terrestrial environments, the major groups of plants, and kind of how they are related. And with plants, it's kind of um, we're pretty sure plants came out of some of the green algaes. These are um, aquatic plant aquatic organisms that uh, are well adapted to aquatic environments. And both plants and algae have this alternation of generation life cycle where uh, they do photosynthesis in a uh, body that uh, has two forms. One is the gametophyte, which is a haploid form, which has one set of chromosomes. And gametophytes give rise to gametes that fuse and produce a sporophyte, which is a body that has two sets of chromosomes, uh, and so it's diploid. Okay, and it grows by both grow by mitosis, and then the sporophyte forms spores through meiosis. Okay, different plants will have uh, the sporophyte or the gametophyte gam gam gametophyte form being dominant. Okay. So when we look at plant green plants, um, these we can divide them in two broad groups, the non-vascular and the vascular plants. The vascular plants have xylem and phloem. The non-vascular plants uh, are very flat plants that are very, very short. They have no tissue for transporting uh, water or nutrients, and so they, they can't grow very tall at all. They are uh, at most a couple inches and, and in many ways kind of flat. And these are the bryophytes, including liverworts, hornworts, and mosses. And I'll show you some of those. And then the vascular plants are divided into the seedless plants, which are the club mosses, spike wasses, and things like that. And then some horsetails and ferns, which are more advanced. These have vascular tissues and can grow tall, um, but they don't produce seeds. And then we have two groups of seed plants, the gymnosperms and the angiosperms. Um, early plants grew only a few inches tall because they were non-vascular plants. Uh, they basically individual cells have to be able to get water and so they have to be in a moist environment and can't be very far from water. Um, on land, plants develop shoots and rigid molecules for support to reach light they grew taller and captured more light to do that. Um, and uh, as a prerequisite for getting really tall, plants had to develop vascular tissues to transport water and food derived from photosynthesis because only the tallest parts of the plants would get light. Uh, and so you had to transport things down from the tallest parts and you have to transport water up. So xylem and phloem. Okay, in addition, uh, unlike algaes, water loss is a big problem, and so plants develop a waxy outer covering, a cuticle, to protect the stem and leaves from drying out. But this also created a problem. It prevented carbon dioxide from reaching inner tissues, so plants had to develop pores or stomata to overcome this problem. Various other things happened as well, developing pigments to protect from higher intensity of sunlight in terrestrial environments, um, you know, developing poisonous compounds to, de to uh, deter predators, um, and using animals as a, a form of uh, transport is important. Okay, so non-vascular plants, liverworts, this is, they typically look like an algae that's just kind of attached itself to a rock. Uh, so they have very few structures. The body is called a a thallus. It's very flat. Uh, they have no roots. They just kind of have some rhizoids that will attach to the ground, but they're they're not strongly attached. In these plants, the gametophyte, the haploid form, is dominant, um, and so this body has uh, one set of chromosomes, and the um, regions of the gametophyte will develop into um, uh, structures that will produce male and female cells that can fuse then to perform the sporophyte. Non-vascular plants are short. They, they only grow in wet environments and they grow relatively slowly. Um, slightly more advanced 
non-vascular plants include the mosses. And in here, the, uh, um, the, again, the gametophyte is dominant. What you see usually when you see a moss is the gametophyte and the sporophyte grows on top of it. Um, for both uh, liverworts and mosses, they produce uh, a sperm that's flagellated. And one of the key things is that they can only reproduce when the plant is almost entirely covered by water because the sperm has to swim. Um, and, and so um, they develop a spore that can, can spread a little bit, but this being covered by water limits reproduction. Okay, so vascular plants then develop xylem and phloem to, to transport water up to the upper parts of the plant and sugars and proteins down to the roots. Um, true roots happen after you develop vascular tissues because true roots have vascular tissues within them. Um, some vascular plants are seedless like horsetails. These are still growing wet, disturbed areas. Um, they're they're uh, um, you know, a seedless vascular plant, so they still produce spores, they still produce um, gametophytes and things like that. They still produce a flagellated sperm. Uh, likewise, uh, ferns are vascular plants that don't produce seeds. Uh, they're probably the most common and most well-known seedless vascular plant. They can be much taller than the non-vascular plants, and there's lots of fern species. For a time, they were the dominant plant and are found in most environments on Earth, but they still require a wet area. Here, this shows a developing frond. A frond is a compound leaf that unrolls from this fiddlehead. Um, they have a dominant sporophyte. The major part of them, as you see, is diploid. And um, the sporophyte produces spores through meiosis, and these spores develop into a gametophyte. So they land on a wet environment and they produce this, this thallus. And this gametophyte, then uh, this is where we have fertilization. And so it does have to be covered by, by water. And uh, then you'll produce a, a fertilized egg that will then produce a vascular plant, the sporophyte again. Okay. So then finally we get to the uh, vascular plants with seeds. Okay, the first of these are the gymnosperms. They're plants with naked seeds. They include ginkgos, cycads, and conifers. Here again, the, do the dominant form is the sporophyte. So the body of these guys, like a coniferous tree, is diploid. And it can produce uh, the, the gametophyte right on the cone uh, inside. And so they have a, um, a, a cluster of leaves and the gametophyte develops within that cluster of leaves. Um, and so they have in the um, female cones, you produce the megaspore, uh, which is 2N and it will go through, um, or the megaspore, which will develop into the female gametophyte, which can then be fertilized with pollen. And so pollen is one of the big advantages here. Pollen comes from the male strobola, which is the, the male cone. And the pollen uh, here grows, is trapped on that female cone and then grows into uh, uh, the pollen tube and fertilizes the egg and then the seed develops. Uh, pollen and, and seeds uh, allow vascular plants that these seed plants to reproduce in completely dry environments uh, and the vascular tissues allow them to go much larger. Um, another group of seed plants are the angiosperms and these are the uh, plants that have flowers and fruits and here again the dominant form is the sporophyte and the gametophyte occurs within the flowers and in, in uh, perfect plants, they have both male and female organs uh, with, contained within the flower. Some plants will go to male and female flowers or, or being monoecious where a plant has one set. And here you have the double fertilization where you get large seeds where the embryo forms and the endosperm forms, which contains lots of food for the seed. 
Okay, so again, pollen and seeds free plants to reproduce in dry environments. In flowering plants, the ovary uh, of the carpal develops into a fruit as well. And here, pollen is not carried just by wind, but pollen can be carried by animals and uh, can be uh, moved easier so the plant can have a transport mechanism.